There's never going to be a man's physique. He didn't have much of an off season. I like his physique better. I'm always very energetic. I will have to put me as one of the greatest. Mr. Olympia was won by the back. Hello, Bob. What's up, buddy? How you doing, man? How you been? <laughs> Hanging in there, bro. <laughs> you, man. Good to see you, man. It's been a long time. Yeah. I was looking to uh, forward to doing this interview in person, man, but, you know, things got really crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's actually a uh, good thing we um, put it off because uh, New York's in lockdown, man. I mean, they're, it's a nut house. Yeah, but I definitely want to, you know, do one when things kind of blow over a little bit. We should definitely do one in person, man. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, once this craziness gets done. It's absolutely insane. So you are in Georgia right now, right? Yeah, I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. So I heard in the news yesterday that over there everything is open, the business is kind of operating kind as normal, of. right? Um, yeah, I mean, it's surprisingly normal, you know. I mean, uh, I went to the um, Costco's the other day. Everything was pretty pretty regular. <laughs> I mean, other than toilet paper. Toilet paper was gone for some bizarre reason. I but. know, that's insane, man. But <laughs> it's crazy because New York, California, many other states, people are just literally stuck at home. So, I, you know, yeah. obviously, it's, it's a crazy situation. That that it is, yeah. Hopefully, uh, hopefully, hopefully, a few weeks of this crap and it'll be done. But who knows, you know. So, what kind of effect do you think this will have on bodybuilding? Because I know a lot of shows are being canceled, right? Some things are still up in the air. What do you think? What, what's the big effect that will have? You think? Well, I mean, it depends on how far it goes. Um, if it goes long, then it'll have a huge effect because we'd have to make we'd have to uh, make all kinds of provisions because nobody'd be qualified. So. The USA, the Nationals, the North Americans, uh, the uh, uh, universe, you know, we'd have to come up with some sort of a resolution as to why, how people could compete. The other problem is, is with gyms closed right now and things like that, nobody can really get ready. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it could delay things. I don't think it's going to be that long. I think in, I think literally in a couple of weeks, we'll see a big push of, to, to get back to normal and then by... Um, I think sometime in May, I th yeah, everything's kind of back to normal. So, I really hope so, man. Just, do, yeah. do, do you think there's a chance of Olympia being canceled this year? Because so far no. it's it's on, but you don't think nah. so? Nah, almost zero. I mean, unless this thing went to the fall, <laughs> so uh, which I really the the economy wouldn't sustain it. So I mean, uh, and that if that's the instance, and then, then all hell breaks loose. But nah, I think we're good. You know, I think the later shows will be okay. I don't think anything past uh, May May is going to be affected personally but we'll see did you uh what was your experience at the arnold lake um because it was just uh what, what was that like being there this year um and still kind of being in the midst of it all you know it was interesting for people in the industry we'll call them industry people um it was surprisingly normal i mean it really wasn't much different at all the biggest difference was there was no fans you know what i mean but uh for us it was it was kind of normal you know saw, saw the regular faces regular people you know, we did as much as we could do, um, you know, that, that didn't get affected, you know, that you, it, it was really odd. It was weird because they, they allowed people to come in for some things and not for others. So, uh, you know, they were one of the first people to have to deal with all this garbage. But, um, it, it, like you say, it wasn't that much different for me, really, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> were you, were you concerned? Because people are coming from all over the world there. Were you concerned for your own health? Nah, not really. I think it's a lot, I think a lot of it's overblown, um, you know. I got my own thoughts on it, you know, but, you know, it, it's, it would be much more widespread if it was that easily transmitted. And, you know, we took precautions as anybody, you know, you got the hand sanitizer and all that stuff, but what are you going to do? You know? So, um, I don't know. I, I, you know, it, it's, I guess it's one of those wait and see type of things, you know? I agree with you. So, um, let's talk about Olympia again. What, you know, there was recently obviously announced that it was sold American media Inc. sold, sold it to, uh, to Jake Wood. Um, what can you, what can you tell our audience about a sale that they might not know? Uh, well, I mean, it's it's you know it's a public um, uh, information, obviously, so most people know all the basics. Um, Jake is a great guy uh, to have the Olympia uh, in his hands. Um, the difference between you know private and versus public um, is. The minute, the minute corporate gets involved, okay, and AMI is a corporate entity and has been, obviously, for, since day one, um, what you don't get is passion. You don't get passion. You don't give love for the game. David Packer, AMI, the whole crew uh, that, you know, the, the business end of things, 
they don't know bodybuilding. They never were into bodybuilding. It's not how they grew up. It's not, it wasn't like Joe Weider. Okay. Um, so, you know, it's not like they did a horrible job but under the direction of, uh, uh, Robin Chang, who I worked with for many years. Um, you know, I think we did what we could do with what we had to work with. Unfortunately, Robin, his hands were tied a lot of the times where we had to continue to put out, uh, the same or better product with less and less and less money budget. Everything was budget. Can't do this cause of budget. Can't do that cause of budget. And that's the problem when you get into, um, again, corporate versus private. Jake Wood has passion and love for bodybuilding, women's bodybuilding, men's bodybuilding, and the entire sport of bodybuilding. Um, so now what I think you're going to see is a return um, of the Olympia and moving forwards. I, I think we spun wheels for the better part of 14 years. Um, we didn't take any steps backwards, but we didn't really go forwards either. So uh, with Jake Wood now in, in an ownership position with Dan Solomon, my good buddy, um, you know, in the uh, uh, position of uh, putting it on, uh, Tamer Al Gindi, again, another uh, a great close friend of mine, you know, in the producer role. We got a great team. Tim Gardner in there now. Uh, he was just named. Uh, he's going to be overtaking um, the expo duties and things like that. You're going to see, and the fans are going to see a lot of great positive changes moving forward. I say we take more steps forward in the next through two to three years than we've taken in the last 14. Wow, that's that's amazing news for the for the fans, of course. Uh, because I think yeah. some concern was that, you know, now that a corporation like AMI is no longer involved, is it going to be the same type of budgeting and backing that, that you just mentioned? You know what I mean? No, that was it's going to be. <laughs> so that's the problem. Is Let me just give you a scenario, Vlad, okay? Uh, I'm an idea guy. A lot of people know that. I come up with things all the time, have for many years, uh, whether it be the NPC, the IFBB Pro League, um, uh, uh, NPC Worldwide now with my shows overseas, uh, with two bros, you know, my partner Ian Constable. Um I've had ideas for years that I've brought to the table for the Olympia. Here's the problem, okay? I come up with an idea. Let's just say it's to, um, I don't know, get all the former champs together, okay? Now, the first question that comes back to me is, okay, great, Bob, how much is it going to cost? You know, and I've come up with some number, okay? It's like, well, it's probably going to cost us, I don't know, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 to get these guys together, get a booth, let's make a Olympia Legends booth, you know, something like that. Okay, now... I've got to try to convince a guy who's probably never even seen the inside of a gym, let alone know anything about bodybuilding, okay? Because his question is going to be, okay, it's seventy thousand dollars is what you're saying it's going to cost. What's the return? Well, there isn't a automatic numerical re return uh, for some of these type of things, okay? This is it's it's an idea to be put in place to give more for the fans. Okay, so that when you go there to, to get the Olympia experience, you're treated to some things, you know, that you get that you're paying for to, to go see. Well, it doesn't have an, an automatic ROI, okay? I'm trying to sit, put there, put something in place that's going to be better for the Olympia, better experience for the fans. Now, it doesn't necessarily have a, a ticket price to it. It's just part of, let's say, the expo, all right? Again, this is a guy looking at a ledger, and he's going, so you're telling me it's going to cost us $70,000 to do this, and there's no monetary return? And you can see where this falls on deaf ears real quick because they can't justify. Okay, this is a guy, again, his job is to do numbers. It's not his fault per se, but this is different than me, let's say, hypothetically going to Dan Solomon and Jake Wood and going, hey, I've got an idea. Here's how much it's going to cost. Well, they understand the implication of why this is a good idea or, hey, the fans would love that. And this would be great because ultimately you want to give a reason for the fans to come back. It can't just be an expo full of booths. Nobody has ever come to the Olympia because there was going to be a booth there. So you've got to give an experience. You see what I'm saying? You've got to give an experience to the fans that they have a good time. Wow, man, did you see that? They had this and they had that. And man, what a, what a great time. I'm coming back. And that's where I think we can get to some, some better uh, propositions going forward, some ideas that can be looked at. And no, not everything's got an ROI of right now. Okay, what I can guarantee you is over the next two, three, four, five years, ten years, this is going to be a huge impact of why people would want to come and support the Olympia. For sure, man. That sounds good. Um, what did you take on the Rocks Athleticon that's going to take place? Uh, actually, I think in Atlanta, right, this year. Um, yep, it's right here. You, in Atlanta, yeah. Right. Do you, what, do you, what, what did you take on that? And do you, do you see it as a competition for Olympia or a supporting, uh, supporting entity for Olympia? Well, this is kind of funny because it's been kind of portrayed out there as if it's some sort of competition for the Olympia. Let me just clear up a few things for, for the fans that are watching. Number one, uh, I'm all for it. I've been friends with The Rock since before he was The Rock, okay? 
Um, we go way back to to L.A. and, and, and you know, hanging out there in, in our spare time and stuff. Great guy. Uh, Danny Garcia, very smart. Uh, they do great business together. Um, and he, all he's done in the last 10 years since then is, has become the biggest star in the world. Okay. So, um, I think it's fantastic to have him involved. Number one, this is a pro league event. Okay. It's not competition. This is sponsored. I shouldn't say sponsored. It's, uh, sanctioned by the IFBB pro league, the NPC worldwide under Jim Mannion. Okay. So this is part of us. Okay. It's one of our shows. So it's not competition. Number two. Um, you got to kind of get in line here. I think the Arnold's been around a little bit longer and a guy named Arnold Schwarzenegger, who's done a few things in his time as well. Um, uh, they've been around, you know, so I think they've got a pretty big show. Um, the purse that was originally proposed and I, and I believe they're still going forward with this was about a million dollars in prize money. Now that quickly got misconstrued to, Oh, they're putting out a million dollar prize money. It's like, well, wait a minute here. It's a million dollar purse. And they have chosen at least the last I knew about it. Um, uh, they chose to. Uh, want complete parity in the prize money, and then every uh, division gets the same amount of money. Okay. Now, if you take a million and you, you split it up, and it's I think there's eight divisions. We'll go with that. Okay. You're looking at a little over a hundred thousand dollars per division. So let's just take I don't know, pick something. Women's bikini. Okay. Um, I don't know why I have to say women's bikini. It's not like there's a men's bikini, but you know. Um, but we'll take bikini, okay? So that's, let's say it's $120,000. Now, generally, as purses get split, it's usually half and half and half and half uh, or close to it. So if it's $120,000, half would be sixty, dollars So it would be a $60,000 first prize. You know, and it would probably go from there, you know, 60, 30, 15, you know, that, that type of thing. Okay. So listen, that's great. And it's beautiful for the athletes. And it's a great opportunity. Um, and listen, anything that puts money in the, in the athlete's hands, as everybody knows, as the athletes rep for many, many years, I'm all for, but let's not get carried away. There's a big difference between a $60,000 first place. Uh, and that's, by the way, that's great for all the other divisions, except for men's open, which puts in the probably fourth or fifth in terms of prize money. I think the prod pro is higher and, and you know, uh, you got the New York pro and, and all these other uh, high end shows that have been around. Um, listen, that's fantastic, but 60,000 isn't 400,000 at the Olympia. Uh, nor the prestige of the Olympia title. So this is fantastic. It's a great opportunity. I welcome it. I'm all for it. I support it 100%, uh, as we do in the IFBB Pro League and the NPC Worldwide. Um, but no, it's not competition for the Olympia. It was never intended to be competition. Uh, the Olympia title has been around since 1965, and everybody knows the history and all that stuff. Um, if it had zero money, it, it's still the Olympia title. It still means you're the best in the world. Got it. Are you um, excited for women's bodybuilding to come back to Olympia? Because for a while it was kind of, you know, it was, it was banned from it. Now it's coming back in a big way from my understanding. Do, are you excited about it personally? Well, I think it's definitely an exciting time for, for the girls that are involved. Uh, am I excited? I'm a business guy. Um, I look at things that have, um, you know, either a monetary reward or it's got to, um, you know, it's, it's got to have some value to it, you know, to the Olympia. Um, it's been gone for some years. We all know the history of that. It's been brought back. Um, I think the direction that, that Jake, uh, and his crew over there, Alina Popa and the rest of the crew, um, have wanted to take it, I think is a positive thing. Uh, I think it could be good. Uh, perhaps it could recharge, um, and bring more interest to women's bodybuilding. Uh, people have to understand it's still an extreme sport, just like men's bodybuilding is. There's no difference. That's why we're not mainstream. Okay. We don't appeal to to quote mainstream people. Um, we do appeal to our own people and we've got millions of them. Okay. So I think it's an exciting time for women's bodybuilding to get back on that stage. I think Jake, um, his, his passion cannot be denied. Again, he's put his, his uh, heart and soul and his money into keeping it alive. Uh, and we'll see what direction it goes. Markability is everything. So if it goes down a, a certain path and I think we can, we can lo uh, look at some of those things. Um, I think it could get back to a place and, and listen, Maybe that just brings up everything in terms of uh, uh, women's physique, uh, which is women's bodybuilding. Okay. It's just a, a, a softer form of, we'll call it, you know, a, a little bit lesser on the extreme. Um, extremes have extreme reactions and that can be good or that can be bad. Um, so building that fan base back, getting it back on the Olympia stage, uh, I think is all positive. And, and uh, listen, God bless the girls because they work hard. And it's never been an issue of anybody working harder than anybody else. We all get that everybody works hard. 
Uh, what it gets into is supply and demand. Okay. And people have to have an interest. I mean, listen, you can make ballroom dancing part of the Olympics, but I don't have any interest in it, you know, and I'm not going to have any interest in it. So it's just one of those things where it's how you package it. It's how you put it out there. Um, and, and I think done properly, I think it, it can be, uh, it can have a resurgence like it did back in the late eighties, early nineties. For sure. Now, what I always enjoy watching even more than Olympia itself is a press conference the day before the Olympia. Yeah. Um, you obviously, you, you always host it. You ask the questions from the athletes. Now, do you, can you tell me about the most intense moment that you've experienced at the press conference? Cause you've done a lot of them obviously over the years, but what was that the most intense moment? Whether it was like, it was like, Wow, even for you, it was, it was maybe too much. Um, we've had a whole bunch, uh, especially if you go back. It's funny because it wasn't that long ago, but if you go back to about 10 years ago, um, man, we, we had three or four in a row when me and Dan Solomon were doing it. Uh, it's kind of an offshoot of our, of our pro bodybuilding weekly days. Um, and, man, we had some battles back then with uh, Quincy and, and Silvio Samuel and, and uh, you know, calling him an ankle biter and Melvin Anthony uh, Gunther, Ronnie, you know, I mean, they, listen, those guys would take stuff off right there and start posing down, you know, they, they weren't shy, you know what I mean? But, uh, uh, uh Gustavo Bedell, um, geez, we, we had some great ones, but I would say probably one of the most intense exchanges was between Phil and Kai. Um, because I mean, and everything's uh, it's scripted, like, like, look at this isn't WWE. Okay. We, we don't have that type of, uh, of activity. Uh, even though me and Triple H actually did host it some years ago and had, had a little bit of fun with it. Um, what you see is very real uh, and none of it's scripted, zero. I can tell you that firsthand is obviously I'm the one running it. Um, but those two got into it and they were getting, they was going back and forth. Right? I thought some tables were going to start you know, getting pushed out and, uh, you know, Kai and Phil were, might, might go at it. And, and as you saw, that manifested on stage as well. Uh, where they kind of came nose to nose and, and Phil kind of had enough of, of Kai's uh, antics and, and back and, and, and uh, back and forth. Uh, it, listen, Phil's no angel either. Okay. He can talk as good a smack as anybody. He played division one basketball. He comes from a, 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 you know, that's what they do. And so, um, you know, he puts out his fair share. Kai was, was having a little fun and, and Phil kind of got fed up with it. And then he, he did the famous flip of the, uh, you know, the, the predator tail there. And, um, you know, Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, that was probably one of the more intense uh, times I ever remember. Yeah. The crazy thing about that press conference, I feel like nobody, because Kai was always very, very quiet in the press conference. He didn't he didn't talk much. He would always kind of like be polite, you know, smile, put the microphone down. You know what I mean? But at that one, he really like yeah. was very vocal. <laughs> I don't know what, what happened, well, right? but it was, he was very vocal in that one. <laughs> well, I, I can tell you what happened. I talked to Kai in the back, okay, before we went out. Um, and, and I generally do this at every press conference, but this one I really, you know, wanted to be emphatic to these guys, especially Kai, because it's like, look, at nobody wants to go out there and hear how you just want to bring your best package and, you know, let's see what happens, you know, all that low-key, nobody cares. That ain't selling tickets, okay? I says, Kai, I really need you to bring it out there today, okay? Listen, it's a show. No matter how you dice it, okay? Take a, take a page from WWE, UFC, okay? You pick it. It's a show, okay? Nobody takes nothing personally, but I need you. He says, well, what do you want me to do? And I go, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just telling you to be yourself, okay? Don't hold back. Just let it fly, okay? That's exactly the conversation that we had backstage prior to going out. So he obviously took heed to that, and he, he let it fly. He didn't hold back. And you know Kai as well as I do, I and mean, you guys do a lot of stuff with him. He's, he's difficult to actually uh, – uh, as eccentric as he is, it's harder to, to get him out of his shell, believe it or not. He almost has a dual thing, like like a, a, a you know Incredible Hulk, you know Bruce Banner versus the Hulk kind of thing, where it's like, well, he's the most eccentric guy I know, but sometimes he's actually shy and tough to get you know info out. Or the info you do get out, you need an interpreter, because I don't know what he's saying. But um, I like Kai. I mean, Kai's, everybody thinks for some odd reason I don't like Kai, and it's we actually get along great. We have a lot in common. Um, we, we love comics, and, and I grew up with uh, – being an avid comic collector, the superhero thing, all, all that stuff. So uh, um, I like talking to Kai. I mean, he, listen, he's a, he's a different guy, and that's cool. I mean, he's pretty boring if we were all the same. But uh, he brought it, man, and, and I loved it. And the fans loved it because that's what they wanted. They wanted real. They want 100%, and that's what they got. Did you witness uh, a rivalry and like fights between uh, King Kamali and Craig Titus? Did you witness it? Because uh, you competed at the same, the same with King Kamali, right, I think? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we... Um, 
Um, well, me and King go way back. Uh, I love King to death. Okay. He's one of my best friends in this industry. Um, and how we came to be is we actually competed against each other in the 99 nationals. Um, now I was making my comeback. I, I had back surgery fusion, um, in 98 as I was getting ready for the USA and everybody knows my story up to that point. I broke into the national, um, arena in 87, 87, <laughs> at the national championships after winning the juniors. Um, and then just at a, a difficult time, I'm, you know, zeroing it in, coming hundred percent, got some close calls, got some second places, top fives. So anyway, long story short, 98, I destroy my back playing baseball. I, mean, I think a big home run swing and a, it's kind of a weak link in the armor and, and, it, and it snapped the disc in half. Long story short, um, after the USA that year, which, you know, I, um, um, the, the surgery was, scheduled for after the show, but I got it, you know, they, they basically took out and then they, they, you know, fused together the spine. Um, so I'm about an inch shorter than what I should be. <laughs> that said, um, 99, I kind of got my stuff back together, uh, hooked up with a good friend of ours. We both know called named George Farah. Um, now George back then was just George from the gym. Okay. He wasn't a guru. He wasn't world famous. Okay. He didn't have any Olympians. Um, we did, we trained in the same gym in Rochester, New York, which is a very rich history. Uh, with Danny Padilla, Pete Grimkowski, uh, all, all kinds of uh, pros that, that came out of Samson's gym. And uh, me and George hooked up, and he seemed very knowledgeable. He knew his stuff. Um, went to that show. Now, we're in the same class. I came in about 10, 15 pounds lighter because I was coming off of about five months of training. Um, and we said, you know what? I'll, I'll just go in that class, and that's, that's cool. Because normally I'd have been in the, the supers, you know. So me and King end up, you know, I don't know who King is at this point. He's, he's a young kid coming out of the collegiate area. You know, we ended up going one and two um, in, in that class. So uh, he got the nod over me. And um, but at some point we were in line and he um, and he turns around and he goes, uh, Mr. Chicarello. <laughs> and I'm looking around like, was my father here? Like, you know, Mr. And he goes, I just wanted to say I, I grew up, uh, you know, admiring your physique. And I actually had a picture of you in my locker, in my in, in gym, you know, my uh you know, in, uh, at the school. And I'm like, Oh Jesus. I'm like, come on, bro. So anyway, we struck a friendship after that. And then, um, in uh, classic Rocky fashion. So, so he goes on and, and turns pro. Um, so I got to wait my turn basically at the 2000 USA. Um, so once again, George is, is going to help my preps. Now we're, we're thinking this is it. Like if I'm going to ever do this, man, this is it. Uh, this is my chance. So I got George in my corner. By this time, me and King are, are, are close friends. We're, we're making all kinds of appearances at shows and things. We're having a great time because he's got the same mindset I do, which is WWE style. Let's bring some fun to this stuff. And uh, We're ripping on people, just having killing people. Uh, he didn't like Craig right off the bat. Neither did I. But um, that became a rivalry and all that. So, yeah, I witnessed all kinds of stuff with that, uh, which was kind of interesting and fun at the same time. And, uh, um, you know, he was making bets out there against Lonnie Teeper that I was going to turn pro and this and that. If, if I didn't turn pro and win the USA, he was going to wear a dress on stage at the night of the champion. Right? It was all this crazy stuff, right? But um, and then in a clear moment of, of Rockyism, he um, he came to my room. We're at the USA, and I've, I'm dialed in. I mean, I am one. I'm, if, 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 this, if this doesn't do it, bro, I'm done. I can't do any better than what I'm going to bring. Right. Okay? And uh, he comes in, he says, let me take a look at you, bro. So I put my trunks on, I hit some shots, and he goes, are those the trunks you're going to wear? And I go, yeah. And um, he goes, nah, I don't think so, right? He says, hang on a second. Like, okay. He, he leaves, he comes back two minutes later, he's got a bag. He pulls out a pair of trunks and he throws them to me. And I, and I go, what's this? And he goes, try these on, right? And I put them on. Well, they're these black kind of sequin trunks that he had on when he won the the nationals. And, uh, I tried them on, they, they fit great. They're, you know, CJ custom, you know, the whole thing. And he's like, uh, you know, he's like, yeah, man, we're, you know, and they, they look great. I mean, they were a lot better than the ones I had because if you're going to win, you got to look good, man. Let, let, let's get this. And, uh, you know, I would go on, I won the USA turn pro the whole thing. I just, just make sure to wash them before you give them back. All right. So, but yeah, he didn't like Craig and Craig didn't like him and I didn't like Craig and, you know, we, None of us got along. No. Yeah, so. yeah, that was a crazy. That was because they were almost they almost fought on stage or something like that, right? Is that true? Oh yeah, yeah. They definitely had some battles on stage. Uh, uh, my stuff with Craig was, you know, I never really had a problem with Craig until until I beat him. 
Um, and my buddy Tom Prince, uh, who everybody remembers, he told me straight out because we were talking about it one time, and he says, you know, I go, I got to be honest, man. I mean, I know he's, you know, he gets a lot of flack, a lot of people, he rubs a lot of people the wrong way, but I go, he's always been nice to me, and he goes, yeah, just wait till you beat him, and then we'll see. And, and sure enough, I'll be damned. The next show, I beat him, and then he started talking trash after that. Started accusing me of t- using synthol, all this weird stuff, you know. And you know, I'm like, where's he coming up? You know, but I'll, Tom was dead on, man. As soon as I beat him, then he started trash talking. But uh, I wasn't, you know. Listen, I'm from New York. I didn't, you know, we don't. I didn't grow up with, you know. You didn't talk crap unless you were willing to put up, you know. And um, it came to a head at the USA that that year where. We were going back and forth on Get Big online, and um, you know he was talking all kinds of trash. And that's like, look at bro, I'll be. I ain't like the rest of these guys, okay? I ain't gonna just sit there and talk smack. You want to see me? I'll be at the USA on whatever the date it was in that year. All right, you got something to say? Come up and say it. And um, okay, he's, yeah, okay, man, yeah, we'll see yeah, yeah, the whole thing, huh? Okay. And Ron Avedon can back this up because I mean, there's a whole bunch of people there, but you know, Ron's one of those good guys. You know, he. He calls it the way it is, but I walked into the lobby over at the uh, uh, UNLV where it's been forever, you know, and there was Craig sitting there talking to him. I literally walked in the door, spotted him. I walked straight over to Craig about six inches from his face and I go, all right, now what? And he didn't know what to do. I mean, he was completely like a deer in the headlights because I'm calling him out. I mean, and there's, there's 20 guys around, and everybody just kind of went silent looking like, oh, man, what's going to go on here? And he's like, oh, come on over here, bro. Come on over here. Yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, let's just talk for a minute. You know. Yeah, okay. You know, you want to, I was calm. I wasn't like a big, act like a tough guy. I just went up and says, okay, I'm here. What do you want to do? And it was up to him. You know, we, I said, we can go roll, go roll around the parking lot like a bunch of idiots, or uh, what do you want to do? And we walked over to the side, and he, and he kind of made his peace, and, you know, ah, I was a bro. Uh, yeah, you know, you know, kind of half apologized, and, you know, but. He didn't want to get into it on the spot, but you know, he's, he was a blowhard, man. He, uh, you know, he was just one of those guys and, you know, we all know what happened to him. So, I mean, um, you know, yeah, for those but, viewers that don't know, he's, he's in prison still, right? He's, he's doing, uh, he's doing like 50 years. <laughs> yeah, or something like that. yeah. He's not seeing the light of day anytime soon, but you know, he was a classic bully. You know, he bullied people smaller than him, people weaker than him. But when he was challenged by somebody he didn't know about, you know, or he didn't have that sense, he backed down quick. Um, but I did enjoy the, 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 all the fun, though. I mean, the, the rivalries and the, the smack talk, especially between King and, and Craig was legendary. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Bob, what was, the most in, what was the most extreme or over-the-top physique you ever seen in person? And I know you've seen a lot over the years. What was the most one that just blew your mind completely? I mean, you, you got to put Ronnie up there. I mean, this guy, I mean, I competed – with Ronnie from the time we were amateurs. Now he was in that classic, now classic, uh, the 91 nationals, which to this day is regarded as the toughest nationals in history. Uh, and it'll probably never be beat. Uh, when you look at that initial lineup of, of, uh, it's a who's who, um, you know, with, uh, uh Kevin Lavroni who just won the juniors and ended up winning the nationals that year. Uh, Lex Wheeler, Paul DeMeo, rest in peace. Um, a guy named Ronnie Coleman was in fourth place. <laughs> Matt Mendenhall in fifth. Myself in sixth. Chris Cormier in seventh. Edgar Fletcher. Dean Caputo. So, I mean, literally, it was, it was a crazy, high, you know. This is why I laugh at the idiots now who go out there and talk about how they're, ah, I just took fifth in a stacked class. And the thing is, like, stacked class? It's like, man, you have no idea. <laughs> you have no idea. Now, keep in mind back then, there was no super heavyweights, okay? So everybody was in the heavyweights that was, you know, you, you could be, you could have a 70-pound difference. I mean, it didn't, didn't make any difference, but, um, yeah, believe me, this is here. You want to see a stat class here? Check this one out, okay? Um, but Ronnie Coleman from that point, okay? Now, he was in fourth, um, and he was good. I mean, you could see this guy had some talent, but he wouldn't emerge for a few years still. But the, the, the physique he displayed in uh, – even at the end of 97, if you go back, people think he kind of emerged in 98. If you look back in 97, you can see this guy coming. Um, and he just built himself and built, built himself. But good God, man, the, the physique he displayed, it was, I mean, we would just laugh. And it wasn't a laugh. Like me and King, actually, we were in there, in, I think it was 2003, when he was like 290 pounds and he walked out there. And, and we were in the row watch, and, and we, we both kind of looked and we started laughing. 
And people want to know why we were laughing. It's like we're laughing because he was so big, so muscular, and so dominant that it was a joke. I mean, it was a joke. I mean, this guy could do stuff. You'll never see that again. You'll never see that again. Not in our lifetimes. If that guy comes around, it's somebody when we're old guys, Vlad, and we're we're waxing philosophic about the old days, you know, that type of thing. That that kind of guy comes around once every 20, 30 years, uh, if not once in a lifetime. But Ronnie Coleman put out some of the most ridiculous, you know, physique and and combination. It was a combination of – I mean, he was huge, but he was as ripped up as a, as a guy who was a buck 60, you know, like that type of thing. That combination, nah, I've never seen any. I've seen some freaks. Marcus Rule is a freak. Um, the physique that guy brought to the 2002 uh, New York Pro, which if this guy don't show up, like if he just shows up like regular Marcus, I'd have a, a New York Pro ring on my finger. Um, but this guy was crazy. I mean, he was a freak, but he was nowhere near Ronnie. Um, and I seen some, you know, Paul Dillette was a freak in his, in his time, but he was no Ronnie. Ronnie was Ronnie. That's the craziness, the, the most crazy I've ever seen. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, it's definitely, he's definitely one of the, everybody always mentions Ronnie, man. <laughs> it's crazy. You know, and, and I've asked Ronnie, um, it's interesting because, you know, we've done 10,000, you know, seminars together, things, appearances, whatever. I always like asking Ronnie, I'm like, so if I took all eight Ronnie Coleman's, right, who won the Olympias, and put you all on stage. Who wins? And without hesitation, he says 98, which is always interesting to me because you can make a case. 2001, Ronnie, was pretty impressive. I, I'd probably pick that. But 2003, Ronnie, I believe if that's the, the, the correct year, that's when he was at his, his biggest. Um, I don't think it was the best, but it was definitely the freakiest. But uh, he picks 98 right off. I mean, no hesitation, 98. I think he liked that physique the best in, in terms of aesthetics, freakiness, all that stuff, hardness. Um, but it's an interesting scenario to think, well, who, who would have won, like, out of all the Ronnies, you know, type of thing. But um, God bless him. He, he's still going, you know, he's still going on and <laughs> doing his thing. But, man, it, it, it took a heavy price, man. Yeah, you know, yeah, for sure. Um, now, I interview a lot of people, Bob, and, uh, you know, bodybuilders, experts in the business. And everybody's almost unanimously keeps saying that the quality of bodybuilders went down over the years. Um, do you agree or disagree with that? Oh, I don't think there's any question. You you can't compare. First of all, I think it's unfair to compare eras in any sport. You know, like you always get the arguments of whatever. If Jim Brown was playing in the NFL today, you know, it's like, look, at, there's a hundred factors that go in. You, you can't, it's not fair to compare eras, okay? Listen, if Arnold was around today and had access to the training and the subs, and, you know, what would he have done? Again, it's, you can't, you can't do it. It's not, it's not fair, okay? But, um, are the physiques better today than they were years ago? No, I don't think anybody would, would claim that. We don't have the depth. I think that's the biggest difference. If you go back again 10, 15 years ago, um, the physiques, listen, there were some great physiques, of course, but the depth, I mean, you go down 10, 12 deep, and it's like, damn, you know, these, these guys are, you know, the best in the world, you know, type of thing. Um, there's a few things I think that have led to the, um, the demise, if you will, of that caliber. Listen, these guys are still tremendous, okay? You've got some great physiques out there still. The best is still the best. You know, could they have competed and done well back in the day? I don't think they would have done as well. They certainly would have been good. I mean, listen, like right now you're in, well, Brandon Curry competed against, you know, Ronnie Coleman and Sean Ray and these, you know. Listen, he's not, okay? So let, that's, let's not put him in that category. But listen, that physique would have done just fine out there. I don't think he beats those guys, but there's a lot of guys who don't beat those guys. Um there's a lot of things that have contributed to this. Um, bodybuilding's a hard sell. It really is. It's, um, you know, listen, we don't make a lot of money per se. Money actually has been better, obviously, in the last, you know, especially, again, five, six, seven years ago, and the, the big contracts were still out. Uh, but this, listen, there's still good money to be made in, in bodybuilding, but it's not like other sports. You know, it, it takes a long time to get there. It's tough to take a kid, and, and society as we know it is what I call, it's like a drive through version of life. Everybody wants something right now. OK, it's, it's not like the old days, bro. You, you Listen, you want food. It's you know, I can go to Burger King right now and have a burger in, in 30 seconds. Boom. There it is. You want something on TV? Boom. I hit a button. It's there. You want something delivered <coughs> to your house? I can have something from Am. Well, not right now with the Corona thing, but I can have something delivered to me in, in hours, like literally hours. So the kids today are growing up in a drive through version of life, which everything is right now. OK, the problem is, is bodybuilding. 
I don't care what drugs come along. I don't care what anything comes along. Okay, it doesn't matter. You have to put time in the gym. Okay, you can't. There's nothing you can do that that replaces time in the gym. I don't care how many drugs you load yourself with. I don't care what new things come up, training techniques. You need time in the gym. It's a slow race. All right, and that's a tough sell when it comes to the youth of today. This is why you see the numbers in bikini and men's physique in particular, which are quadrupled over any other numbers of any divisions. Why? Well, because it doesn't take that long to get ready. It's not that you don't work hard, but that, that level of you know, muscularity and, 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 and you know, uh, development isn't anywhere close to, to bodybuilding. So God bless those people. Nothing wrong with that, but you know, it's not their fault. But uh, to answer your initial question, Ed, no, it's not anywhere close to what it was years ago, but it's what we have now, and that's what we work with. Um, there, there, again, there's, there's a lot of uh, reasons behind that. Um, a lot of physiques, I think, could have been better, but they've gotten ruined with this um, this endless pursuit of size over quality. Um, doesn't work. Listen, it's all a visual people. It's smoke and mirrors, guys. If I'm giving one bit of advice to the, to the young guys out there. Listen, yeah, you can keep injecting your delts, doing endless. You know, you see these crazy delts these days, and it's like that all looks, A, it looks a little weird. <laughs> you know, it doesn't really flow. You know what I mean? Um, B, it makes your arms look smaller, so that you better have some big old guns to go with that, or it just takes away from the, the aesthetics of your arms. If the delts are so big, I don't, if you've got a, a 19 inch arm, it looks tiny. You know, it doesn't work like that. And, and C, the most important thing listen, you, you can, a, an inch off the waist is worth two inches on your shoulders. It's that simple. Bring the waistline down. You can only bring it down so much, you can only build up everything so much. Uh, that's the thing that's been lost over the last ten years, in my opinion. Do you think Do you think the judges in bodybuilding often get get blamed for it? And do you think Do you think the judges are responsible? Because I hear like, well, the judges were judging them, and that's how the the, the shift happened in bodybuilding, just for the size. Yeah. Do, you, do you think it's fair or not fair? That's the dog chasing his tail argument, uh, which I've heard for years now. Um, it's ultimately the, the the we talked about women's bodybuilding earlier. Same argument there. Well, if, listen. If they didn't reward it, we wouldn't bring it. The judges say, well, if it wasn't there in front of us, we wouldn't reward it. <laughs> so, you know, again, it's the dog chasing its tail as to who's to blame. Here's the, here's the answer. Everybody's to blame, okay? Is it the judge's fault per se? No, it's not. Because here's the problem. If 10 physiques are up there and they're all bad, somebody's got to win. So who wins, right? Well, somebody with a bad physique. I mean, listen, that's, that's all we got. Like every time we introduce a new division, like right now, and you're going to see this here, you're going to re uh, record this and log it under your Bob Stradamus, uh, you know, uh, uh, predictions. Okay. Right now we just introduced wellness. Okay. And mark my words, lad, you will see this over this year. As soon as we can get some shows going, uh, past this epidemic, um, a girl goes up there and she wins and everybody goes crazy and they go, oh, so that's what they're looking for. It's like, well, no, not necessarily. That's what was there. Okay, so no, it might, might not be the ideal of what we're looking for, but this is the position you got to put in if, if you're a judge. Is look at my job is to pick who's the best or the closest, fitting the criteria that's on stage in front of me. We can't declare it a, a tie for third place between everybody and nobody wins. I mean, you know, you, you got to go with what you got in front of you. So sometimes it's not the ideal, but it's what you got. Um, now, that said, if the athletes didn't put all that, you know, th those kind of physiques out there collectively, all right? You got to give the judges an option. If there's a better option, they're going to take it. They know what they're looking for. That's the other argument I see. Well, the judges didn't know. They don't know what they're looking for. No, they know exactly what they're looking for. Guess what? It wasn't you, all right? That's the bottom line. It wasn't you. There's no pol oh, it's politics. It's like they, don't, they don't know who you are. Trust me, there's far less politics as you go up. Then the other way around. Everybody thinks, you know, Olympia. Remember years ago, it was, oh, well, but Muscle Tech sponsored the Olympia, so of course Jay Cutler's going to win. Okay, well, then all of a sudden Muscle Tech was out and he was signed with somebody else and he won again. Well, yeah, but it's because he's with Weeder. Okay, well, then he signed with MD and he won again and everybody went, oh, well, uh, you, know, you know, it's like they keep moving the goalposts to fit the narrative. There's, a lot, there's more politics at a local level because everybody knows each other than there ever is at a pro level. You think these judges have any idea? Who somebody is signed with or what company they're with. Listen, these things are interchangeable. They don't, and how would they work? Listen, even if, let's say there was one goofball judge who, who was 
uh, tainted like that. He's got one vote. And the judging system, the way it is, is made in particular to cut out highs and lows. So if everybody got somebody in, in fifth place and you got them in first, guess what? Your score gets thrown out. It's just a safeguard to the judging system. And it's put in place for that very reason. It's also put in place the other way. Everybody's got somebody in first place. You got them in sixth place because you don't like this guy. Guess what? Your vote's getting thrown out. It's the low. So that said, it's still only one vote. You would need a collective of all the judges or most of them, all right, to sway anything going one particular way. It's impossible. So, gotcha. Yeah. Uh, Bob, last question for you. Um, so do you think it would be productive for bodybuilders to form a union? And I understand you were involved in something like that years ago. Can you tell me about that uh, situation, what, what happened exactly with the union that you were trying to get involved with? Um, do I think it'd be productive? Yeah, absolutely. Especially years ago. Um, and yes, I did put myself on the line to, uh, cause I thought it was a good idea. It wasn't, now let me clarify, Led. it wasn't a union against the Federation. It was for the athletes. Okay. There's a difference there. This wasn't some big coup attempt and, you know, we're going in with pitchforks and, you know, uh, you know, torches and, you know, we're taking over to, you know, listen, if everybody was on the same page, you could put certain safeguards in place, certain minimums, things like that. Um, I always think it was a good idea, and I was willing to put that out there. Unfortunately, um, it was not – I wouldn't say it wasn't well-received by the athletes. The athletes seemed to love it. I had at the time 130-something uh, emails of confirmation of, yeah, yeah, you know, this is something we should be looking at and doing and all that. What year, what year, like, what year was that, Bob? Jeez. Uh, I got to think it was around 2003, somewhere in that range. Um uh, I just came off a successful year, took second in the, at the Night of the Champions, uh, took second at the uh, uh, Southwest Texas to Durham Charles, qualified for the Olympia. I mean, things, you know, I had a big contracts and all that. Um, and it was a great time. Unfortunately, the people at the top, bodybuilding's always been made up of the haves and the have-nots. Okay? So the guys at the top were making big money at that time. Don't care. They're like, well, I'm making good money. You know, what do I care about? Some union thing, you know, this and that. The guys at the bottom are the ones scrambling. All right, because they got nothing to lose. And the guys in the middle, well, you kind of go either way. They don't want to ruin anything because they think that might prevent them from, you know, getting to the top. There could be some backlash or, you know, whatever. Put them in a bad light, whatever. Um, ironically, uh, um, you know, I did try to put together, I, I did put together a meeting, uh, which was at the Arnold, I believe it was that year. Um, and I had, you know, I think like 19, 20, 21 people showed up. Out of, you know, God knows how many said they were going to come. But ironically, one of the, the biggest miles out there at the time was your good friend, Lee Priest. Um, you know, yeah, who, who was no stranger to, you know, being Mr. Outspoken and this and that. And we need to do this and we need to do that. And, you know, and to, you know, screw the establishment and all that. And guess who didn't show? Lee Priest. He couldn't have been less concerned, didn't care, didn't show up, didn't nothing. <laughs> nothing. That's why I, I lost a whole lot of respect for him at that point. Of, look at you're going to go out there and you want to be a rabble rouser and you want to kind of, rally, you know, why wouldn't you support this? And the, and the answer was, is he didn't care enough to support it. He just, you know, that told me a whole lot about him. Um, but after that, it became apparent that it, 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 there wasn't enough interest from the bodybuilders themselves. They didn't want to put themselves on the line. A lot of the guys told me personally, they were scared. They didn't want to get a backlash. They didn't want to, you know, if a, um, Sponsoring supplement company, you know, thought that was going to be in a bad light that maybe they would drop them. So, so nothing ever happened. Um, it's crazy because Lee, you know, Lee told us in the, in the movie that were there about him that he was the one that was trying to start the union, but people didn't support him. It's crazy. <laughs> when was that? I would love to know when that is because, like I say, that's a all out lie. That is a 100% mistruth. It's a complete lie. And like I say, not only did he never do that, which I never heard of. If he did, maybe he did it when he was, you know, sleeping in the warehouse there in Australia. Um, he had his opportunity, as did others. They had their opportunity. Listen, this was a generated email. I wasn't doing this behind the scenes. This was out there in front. It was a generated email that I put out to see if anybody was interested in discussing putting together an association, a union, whatever you want to call it. Again, I didn't care because it wasn't against the IFBB. It wasn't against them. This wasn't, you know, a thing where we were button heads and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll you know, we'll tell you what, we, you know, we ain't showing up then unless the, you know, it wasn't, like, it wasn't that type of a thing. 
I just wanted to see if there was any interest in, in getting everybody on the same page, which I think would have been in our best interest. It would have been, of course. Um, but Lee was nowhere to be. He was there. I, I, he was, matter of fact, if, if memory serves, he was about 10 feet away from where the meeting room was, sitting on a table and wouldn't come in the room. That's a fact. And, uh, but there's a lot of stuff. I mean, we could do a whole other segment on that fool because he, uh, he puts out stuff that just <laughs> – he's got his own truth, okay, to that, which – Cracks me up because it's like, look, there is no your truth, okay? There's the truth, and then there's your opinion, all right? So th there's a difference there, you know, but he likes to cry foul and play the victim and all that stuff, and the bottom line is that stuff's played out a thousand times. He had his opportunities, and that was certainly one of them that he could have stood up, um, been a boy. And he was, listen, he was a big name at that time. Um, you know, that could have been instrumental, um, you know, uh, maybe getting other people on board because you need big names to get on board for other people to feel safe and go, hey, He's doing it. Well, then I can do it. What do I care? He's the one that's got more to lose than I do. Um, now, nah, not only did he not support it, but like I say, at no point did he ever put himself out there other than for himself, you know, and that's, that's fine, you know, but, uh, but yeah, would it have been beneficial? Absolutely. Will it ever happen? No. Got it. Got never. it. So Bob, let's, let's end on a positive note. Um, what can you tell me about the future? Um, obviously, of your brand, because you're a brand at this point, you're the voice of bodybuilding, right? What is the future of your brand? How do you see, you know, next year to two years unfolding for you? Uh, well, right now, the brand is pretty much shut down. <laughs> there's no shows. There's no, I've got, you know, I'm not in a good spot right now. I've got uh, two ways I basically make most of my income, and that is uh, emceeing shows, of course, all over the world. Which is which is, con which is constantly, right? Every week almost is a, is a show you probably haven't seen. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. It, there's been years, it's been as much as, you know, uh, almost 40 appearances, you know, so. Uh, and I've got my own shows uh, overseas. Now, if, if uh, God be willing, um, the Ben Weeder, which is slated for next week, is still on in the UK. Um, they've actually taken a different approach over there. They haven't really shut everything down like they have here uh, and we've actually got a good amount of people signed up, so that's that's promising. But I've got eight shows overseas with my partner Ian and our Two Bros brand, and then uh, two shows, uh, well, I shouldn't say here in America, one in Canada with Mindy O'Brien and our uh, uh, Two Chicks Productions. Yeah, little thing out of words there, Glenn. Uh, and then in Austin, Texas with uh, Ed, Ed and Betty Pariso um, that we have slated for August, thank God, because it looks like those will go on. So, um you know, everything was going great until this whole thing hit. So it's not just for me. It's a, a lot of people are in the same boat, but there is literally no business right now. All the shows have been shut down at least until May, uh, which Jim Mannion just put that out the other day. Uh, and that's what we have to do. I mean, there's nothing going on. The gyms are shut down. Nobody can train. Nobody can do cardio. And, and certainly nobody's thinking about getting ready for a competition right now when they've got kids are home from school. You know, all hell's broken loose. So hopefully this stuff will change real quick. Um, what I think is going to happen is uh, a few weeks, it's going to be a little crazy. Then things are going to start to lighten up. I say by May 1, things are starting to get back to normal. And then there's just going to be a huge push of shows um, to get people qualified. Obviously, uh, we as a uh, federation will look at you know lifting certain guidelines because otherwise you just wouldn't have anybody qualified to go on shows. So uh, you know we have to look at some different options of that, which I'm, I'm, I'm sure the, uh, the boys are doing right now. Um, they've already put out a, a mandate that they're extending the Olympia qualifications until the end of August now. Um, so that'll give a little bit more time for pros to compete. Um, I was just talking to Ian today. We had the British, uh, pro that we were going to put out second year, uh, in May. Clearly, I think we're going to, we're going to move that. I, I believe until August, we have our British finals that are there, which is a big amateur show there. I think we're just going to combine those, um, and then give an, an opportunity for pros to, uh, getting ready for the Olympia. The Olympia is going to be outstanding. Um, I don't think any of this stuff will have any impact by then. Um, the show goes on again, Dan Solomon, the crew, Tamer, everybody's making provisions. Um, but I think the changes you're going to be able to see with a guy in charge now that has passion, uh, that has the, the financial restitution, um, and, and the foresight again, Jake is willing to listen to people that know this, this industry. Uh, that's huge because there are things that we can be doing that would make things much more entertaining. Um, I think, and, and I've said this for 20 years in interviews, you can go back and look, um, entertainment's the key, man. We got to make this stuff more exciting. It's no fun. If, listen, if, if you got to have good guys and bad guys, man, you know, evil versus good, you know, that, that type of stuff. Otherwise it ain't no fun. 
Like you mentioned uh, King and, and Craig. Listen, that stuff was outstanding back in the day because people hated either one of them. You loved King and you hated Craig or vice versa, or you just hated them both. But either way, you had passion for it. You had an opinion on it, you know, and that made it interesting. That famous uh, footage with those two going at it on stage, I, I believe it might have been, that might have been in, in, uh, over in the UK, but it was, it was one of those shows. They were battling it out for fourth and fifth. They were battling for the win, but you know what? It was most more of the exciting stuff because everybody knows they hated each other's guts, and they're on stage and they're kind of poking fun at each other and this and that, you know. And it was it was real, but that's the kind of passion we need to bring back to the sport. All right, and I'm in for anything that can bring interest, excitement, make it entertaining. If you know, again, not hokey. We don't have to go back to the WBF days and what they tried with Vince McMahon and all the weird stuff. You don't need all that stuff. We've got characters, we've got people, we've got rivalries, we've got things. We just need to be able to put it out there. Uh, um, and hopefully we're going to be able to bring some of these things uh, to everybody in the coming months to, to make some of this stuff. you know, uh, you, you got to be able to follow along. You know, We don't have a weekly game like the NFL you know, where you follow along. You know, that's what we need, weekly interest, every other week interest, that type of thing, to follow the, bo the bouncing ball until you get to Olympia weekend. Now you care. You know, I don't care whether you're going to watch somebody win or you're watching somebody get their ass kicked. At least you're watching. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Bob, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it, man. You know, stay safe. Uh, you know, for your family, you to be, be safe, man. What we're going to do is we're going to take this interview. We're going to chop it up into parts. And I'm going to release sure. it like every week, you know, piece by piece. Okay. Yeah, let me know if you need anything else, bro. I'm always, you know, to help you and out. I look forward to doing it in person soon, man, after this whole thing, you know. Goes yeah, on. that'd be, uh, yeah, as soon as this stuff calms mm -hmm. down, I can uh, shoot over to New York yeah. or probably yeah. L uh, L.A. If that's, are you in L.A.? Uh, L.A. New York, between L.A. and New York all the time. Yeah. L.A. would be preferable. At least I could get out there to Gold's and uh, get a Bob Bowl, yeah. and, you know, all that good stuff at the house. Sounds, sounds, <laughs> so give me a vacation. Sounds good, man. <laughs> all right, Bob, take care. Be all safe, right. man. Take yeah. care. All right, buddy.